Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure today to, to, to welcome Professor Peter Gallagher from um, Trinity College Dublin, who's going to tell us about a new radio telescope that's being established at Burr Castle in Ireland. Um, uh, many of you will know that Burr Castle is a tremendous place in the history of astronomy. Uh, and for many years, it had the, um, the world's largest optical telescope, where the spiral structure of galaxies was first, um, first fully understood. Anyway, there's now a very new, exciting radio telescope being built at that site, and Peter is going to tell us all about it. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along uh, this afternoon to hear the great story of, of Burr Castle and the contribution that it's made to astronomy. It's a long story that goes back to the 1840s, and that uh, story of astronomy in Burr was reignited in recent times with the building of a new telescope called the Irish Low Frequency Array. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of both of those stories together. Um, it's actually very nice to be in this room. I, uh, as I was walking in this morning, I realized that the first talk that I gave as a PhD student was in this room and my hands were sweating I remember very clearly and my I remember my head kept on shaking from side to side I was so unbelievably nervous but the head the hands are sweating a little bit but the head isn't shaking so I'm okay but there was a question from a very distinguished professor from Oxford Dame Carol Jordan and she went on to become the president of the RAS but she asked me my first question and it was a really hard question along the lines and back in 1973 I did some of that work. I went, oh my God. But I did my best to answer it, and then she told me afterwards I did very well. And so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, hopefully there are some nice hard questions from you uh, towards the end of the talk as well. But I guess uh, for all of us, we're fascinated by the world around us and by the stars. Um, and, and me, and as a physicist, I'm interested in understanding how those stars work. What is it within the stars that makes them shine? What is it within the stars' envelopes themselves that facilitates planets to form? How do planets form? Where are these planets? When I was a kid, there was nine planets. We then got rid of one and went down to eight. Uh, which is very strange still to me. But we now have 3,000 planets that we know out there, and there are many more being discovered every single work week. And that is transformed by instruments. And new scientific instruments, new technologies, are the things that allow us to see further, to see deeper, to see fainter. And this is the story of those great telescopes that allow us to see further in the universe. But I guess it starts off here. Um, this is not my home. Um, uh, looking up at the night sky. And uh, when you look up at the night sky, there are 10 to the 11 stars up there, you know, billions of stars um, up there. And within those billions of stars, how many planets are around there? Telescopes and big telescopes are the things that can help us probe those stars to try and understand them. And then once you look out in greater detail with higher resolution telescopes, you can begin to resolve where these stars are being born. This is a beautiful picture that shows a molecular cloud, a cloud full of molecules, lots of hydrogen in there, and it's the birthplace of stars. But these um, molecular clouds where stars are born um, uh, are make up galaxies. And this is just a small patch of the sky taken with the Hubble Space Telescope that shows all of these uh, galaxies out there. And it's just still shocking to me that there are 10 to the 11. There are billions of galaxies out there. And each of those galaxies has billions of stars in it. And, and often when I'm teaching in Trinity, I go and I write out the number of zeros on the blackboard. And I start on the left-hand side of the blackboard, and I go 1, comma, 0, 0, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0. And I run out of board. But it really demonstrates how many zeros, how many stars are out there. 10 to the 22 stars are out there in our universe. And it's telescopes like LOFAR or like the Leviathan in Parsonstown, as it was called, or Burr, that allow us to see uh, uh, these stars and resolve these beautiful structures that we see in the night sky. Now, the first real step forward was, of course, with Galileo. Uh, and Galileo, in the early 1600s, he didn't invent the telescope, but what he did is he turned that telescope to the sky to see what was within that, that bright spot on the horizon. And um, he built this telescope. It's a very rudimentary telescope. Um, as you can see here, you place your eye here and point it up at the sky. 
and um, or you can point it at the sun and look at the projection uh, from that telescope. But with that very simple instrument, with crude lenses, he was able to make profound discoveries. First of all, he saw that the sun, and this is one of his drawings of the sun, was rotating, it, and, and also it had sunspots on it. And over days and weeks and even months, he followed these sunspots as they progressed across uh, the sun. Now, to us, that doesn't mean an awful lot. But it, in those days, it meant that there was that body was not solid, and it was moving. It was it, it was a rotating, uh, it was a rotating body, and and that was a very interesting discovery. So the so the universe or our world that we can see with these telescopes became more dynamic. It became more active, and I love these drawings here. These were taken. Uh, from, from Jupiter, and he was able to see that there were a number of satellites around Jupiter. There were a number of moons around Jupiter, which he called Io and Callisto and Ganymede and Europa. And he was able to follow these every single day, which said something else. It said, we are not the center of the universe. There's a body out there that things are rotating about. And people didn't like what he said. He got locked up as a result of this. But this, um, uh, this was you know, a small telescope, but it enabled him to make quite a profound discovery. We are not the center of the universe. There are other bodies out there where moons are rotating around. Now, as the years went forward, technology advanced, bigger telescopes were, were built, and William Herschel, here in England in Slough, uh, built this telescope, which had a diameter um, of, of 49 in, and, and a half inches. And this is his telescope here. This is um, a person, just for scale. But this instrument allowed him to realize that there's actually these things called nebulae, gas clouds that you could see. But he wasn't able to resolve any details within one of these gas clouds. And so he catalogued all of these nebulae or gas clouds over the years and came up with this famous catalog of, 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 of these gas clouds, but could not work out what they were. Now, um, the third Earl of Ross then in Burr Castle in Ireland then had this crazy idea that he was going to build an even bigger telescope at sea level in a very cloudy country. Now, both of them were probably <laughs> crazy ideas. But in the case of the third Earl, he had a, a domain, and um, he married very well, which is always a good thing to do. And uh, his wife had lots of money, and she also had a passion for these kind of crazy ideas of building a, a telescope. And I think between the two of them, they probably designed and conceived of, uh, of this telescope. Um, but here he is here. Um, uh, this is, he's re wearing the sash, which is part of the Order of St. Patrick. And this is his medal from the Order of St. Patrick. And he was awarded that for his scientific endeavors. And I believe he was actually awarded that twice. And uh, it's actually still kept in Burr Castle. They were allowed to keep it. So said, we're sick of you winning it now. You can hold on to it now. So he was awarded this for some of his d discoveries. And he went on to become president uh, of the Royal Society. So a very accomplished scientist. But he built this without a plan uh, that he downloaded from the internet. He invented every <laughs> single aspect of it himself. Um, he conceived of the idea that we would have these galleries that enabled the observer to get up on this box here to get up to the top of the telescope. The telescope itself is 16 meters long and 1.9 meters in diameter, or this is um, six foot in diameter, or, 16, uh, uh, or um, about 60 feet long. And um, uh, then once you go above 45 degrees, you can get up onto these galleries up here, and the galleries uh, move in and out, and the astronomer is able to peer through it. But just imagine being up here, um, you know, which is maybe three stories high, at 2 o'clock in the morning, peering through this telescope as it rocks back and forth with a gentle Irish wind blowing past you. Uh, and you've probably had some wine for dinner, and they used to keep a bottle of whiskey uh, in the observer's house over here. So who knows how wobbly it was up there. But for, 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 for him, though, he was still able to make amazing detailed drawings of astronomical objects greater than anybody had actually been able to see before. But his engineering was wonderful as well. This is um, the mirror, one of his original mirrors that he fabricated in Burr Castle. You can see it if you go to the Science Museum here in London. But nobody uh, gave him the, the, the exact formula for how to make that mirror. He decided he'd take a little bit of copper and a little bit of tin, mix them together, 
If you put too much tin in there, it was nice and shiny, but it was too brittle. If there was too much copper in there, it became too yellow. So he combined the two of them together to get the ratio exactly right um, in order to fabricate these mirrors that were tough enough, but they were also reflective enough as well. And also, this is a, a large uh, piece of uh, metal. It's you know, six feet across and probably a <laughs> foot deep. And um, he, he fabricated that in, a, in an annealing oven beside Burr Castle. In fact, the annealing oven is still in behind the castle, covered in, uh, um, covered in bushes and so on. But he worked out that he'd cool it down slowly, because if it cooled down too quickly, it would crack. And uh, uh, so he used the annealing oven, uh, heated by turf, to gradually cool that uh, down, and he created these beautiful mirrors. And then he would uh, form them himself, and he would then be able to create a parabolic shape, and they became uh, the mirrors that he then placed inside uh, the great telescope, which we call the Leviathan, uh, or the great uh, telescope of Burr. <coughs> so what did he discover with this telescope? Um, here's Herschel's uh, drawings from 1833. Um, uh, showing this, this object here called M51. But when Ross first peered through his telescope, he saw this amazing detail within that astronomical object. He was able to see for the first time that these objects had spiral arms. So he was the first person in humanity's um, history to resolve the spiral structure of galaxies. And that must have been really shocking to see this. And these actually, we know now, are dust lanes and gas lanes. And he was able to sketch them out. And he'd do this over several days um, uh, in the evenings um, and uh, then check it again in the mornings. And then he perfected his drawings over the years. Um, and it's interesting, actually, if you look at the visitor book in Burr Castle, I think it's the first page or the second page, uh, some of the first visitors to come and make sure this was right was Airy, who was the, the Astronomer Royal, and um, also Babbage. Both came over from London to say, what is this crazy man in Ireland saying about this object? They peered through and they said, yes, absolutely, there are spiral arms in this galaxy. So an amazing discovery. And if you look at this picture here, which is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see how it compares. Now, I've made it black and white, uh, so it doesn't look so good. Uh, but you can see the spiral arms are captured very clearly in there. And you can also see the companion galaxy uh, is in there as well. And the Earl also indicated different interesting points in there. But this said something to him about the nature of these nebulae. He um, um, deduced from this that it was moving. There was something moving in these objects. The universe out there wasn't static. It was moving, and it was far away. Um, and that's um, you know, a part of this progression of building bigger telescopes, resolving details, and seeing that our place in the universe is smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is a, a zoom in, then, of his uh, uh, object. These nebulae are dynamic and very distant was his conclusion. And if you compare that then to a contemporary picture, um, just to show the great detail that he was able to resolve um, in these uh, uh, objects. So a profound discovery. He also went and looked at other astronomical uh, objects. He looked at the Crab Nebula. And the Crab, he said, it's got these things that stick out. They look like legs. It looks like a crab. He called it the Crab Nebula. Um, he also looked at another nebula called the Owl Nebula. And if you see his, his drawings of it, it's almost like a cartoon. It's got two eyes. And he said it looked like an owl. Um, so he named many of the nebulae that we are quite familiar with um, uh, nowadays. Um, of course, things advanced. And between 1845 and 1917, the biggest telescope in the world, believe it or not, was in Ireland at sea level. I think that's a failing of the rest of the international community for not building another big telescope. But from 1845 to 1917, uh, we had the Leviathan Telescope. But in 1917, those Americans, for you listening on the internet, came along with their billions of dollars, and they built a fabulous instrument called the 100-inch telescope um, in Mount Wilson in California. And um, uh, this is Hale himself. Um, he, he really grappled with trying to raise funding, uh, befriending um, uh, very wealthy uh, American industrialists and hanging out in the right clubs in New York. And eventually, they built the 100-inch telescope, which you can see here. 
But this became the biggest telescope in the world then, and it had 100 inches diameter. But really importantly about this is it had a tracking mechanism. You could put a photographic uh, 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 camera at the, at the eyepiece, and then you could take photographs of astronomical objects. The Earl, I feel, in, uh, in the 1840s, missed a trick. And it's funny, his wife was a wonderful photographer and uh, even dappled with uh, 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 3D photography in the 1840s. But they didn't bring those together, and he wasn't able to take phot photographs of, um, of, the, uh, of these astronomical <laughs> objects, which was unfortunate. Um, but this telescope enabled astronomers then in the 19, uh, from about 1920 to take photographs and also to do spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is the thing that where you take light and break it up into its components and see you can measure temperatures, densities, velocities, and all these kind of interesting things that you want to know about stars. But the great discovery that this telescope facilitated was the expansion of the universe. Edwin Hubble uh, used this telescope uh, to look at galaxies, and he looked at each individual galaxy uh, that he could see, and he measured how far away they were. He used a thing called a Cepheid variable, which is kind of like a standard candle. If the candle is close to you, it's bright. If it's far away from you, it's faint. And he used that with stars to work out how, way, how far away the stars in different galaxies were. But he also was able to work out their speed, how far, how fast they were moving. And he was astounded by the fact that the further away the galaxy was, the faster it was moving. And the closer a galaxy was, the slower it was moving. But the conclusion from that is the universe is expanding. Uh, the universe is expanding at all scales. So we have telescopes from Galileo seeing the sun, the structure of the sun, seeing planets with moons around them. Then we have um, right through to the mid-1800s, um, with Herschel and, and Ross then resolving these structures and seeing galaxies maybe in motion. But then we have on to Hubble, beginning to see that the universe is actually much larger than you thought, and it's expanding. But bigger is better in astronomy, and it's all about getting as much photons or as many photons as you possibly can and seeing fine detail. And in order to do that, you need to build big telescopes. Now, um, Stephen Hawking said, for every um, uh, 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 equation you put in, you lose half your audience. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for doing this, but uh, he did it, so that's good enough for me. Uh, but this equation is a very fundamental equation. What it says is the size of your telescope, the diameter of your telescope, is related to how small a thing you can see. So big telescopes allow you to see small things. That's all of that, tele that, that that equation says. But there's also this annoying wavelength thing in there. Now, for optical light, that's all right, because that's small enough. But if you want to build a radio telescope, radio waves are long. Some of them are centimeters. Some of them are meters. Some of them are tens of meters. So that suddenly becomes very big, meaning uh, that thing becomes very big as well. So with a radio telescope, what you want to try and do is get that as big as possible because that's also big. So that's your challenge, and this is the equation that we all go back to when you're looking for money. I need that to be big for that to be small. Please give me more money to build a big radio telescope. And uh, with this kind of thing, this is demonstrated very nicely here. With a small telescope, you can't really resolve, say, two stars in the sky. But if you have a large telescope, you can resolve these two stars in the sky. And that's the demonstration of this. It actually reminds me of a Father Ted moment. These stars are, you know, these cows are big because they're close. These, star, these cows are small because they're far away. Well, this is a big telescope and you can see things. And this is a small telescope and uh, you can't see things very well. Um, but with this kind of thinking, Sir Bernard Lovell in Manchester just after the Second World War, built this monstrosity of a telescope. And, and if, if you've ever visited this telescope, it really is just the engineering itself. It's just, uh, uh, just fabulous to see. And just for scale, there is uh, this little door down here. So that's where the uh, engineer or the scientist can go in and check out some of the electronics. So this really is a piece of ship engineering more than anything else. And this dish itself... I would love to just put it pointing at the zenith and get on a skateboard, if I could ride a skateboard, <laughs> and go flying around it. So maybe my last departing wish is going to be to take a skateboard onto uh, the Lovell Telescope. Um, 
but uh, I wouldn't suggest that anybody should do that, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but there's a problem with this. Once you point this telescope and move it around, it begins to deform. The dish itself uh, just can't handle the force of gravity on it. So we can't really build telescopes much bigger than that. Um, in Arecibo, uh, in the Caribbean, um, uh, they built an enormous telescope in a valley, but it only points upwards. You just can't build big telescopes. So in order to build really big telescopes, you have to use a, a new technology. You have to use antennas that are dropped at different positions and then bring all of their signals together in order to make pictures of the sky. And this is what they did in Cambridge uh, in the 1960s. And this um, was a discovery made by Jocelyn Belden and Anthony Bush as well. And what they did is they built a telescope, but it was actually not just one telescope. It was many telescopes separated across a number of fields. And this enabled them to be able to resolve things on the sky. But more than that, because they had lots of antennas, they were able to see very faint things. And one night, Jocelyn, who uh, is now Dame Jocelyn um, from County Armagh, uh, made this phenomenal discovery where she saw these periodic blips uh, going along. And just imagine at two o'clock in the morning, uh, sitting in a hut in the freezing cold, and you're pointing your telescope around, and you hear ping, 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 ping. Oh, my God. Uh, there's no mobile phones at this stage, of course. Uh, what on earth is that? And she swung the telescope off to another place. Nothing. Back onto the same source. Ping, 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 ping. Is there somebody trying to talk to me out there? So for fun, I think, she wrote LGM1, LGM2 on this little green men, one little green men, two. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that it wasn't a little green man or woman. It turned out to be... A, uh, a star, a tiny star called a neutron star, about the diameter of Dublin, as I say, about 10 kilometres across. And it's rotating uh, three times per second. A star the size of Dublin rotating three times per second. This is a really fast rotating star, and it's beaming out like a lighthouse. And every time it swings past, it causes a ping. Ping, 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 ping. And she was the first person to listen to that. Goosebumps. Um, but they, uh, her, her boss and a collaborator went on to win the very controversial Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of pulsars. Jocelyn, of course, has gone on to win many, many awards and be recognized uh, for her discovery. But these radio telescopes are weird. They just look odd. You come to a field, it's full of wires. That won a Nobel Prize? Are you absolutely joking? How does a wire that looks like a coat hanger pick up photons from the edge of the universe? It does. And it works in a funny way. Uh, so this is a, a, a pulsar here. This is actually the crab pulsar, which was named by the third Earl of Ross. And here's my aerial. I've got one aerial, because I've got that, I only have about uh, 5,000 euros at the moment. And uh, so I'm going to listen for pulsars. And I've got this nice PC here at the moment. So when that pulsar goes off, it starts going ping, 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 ping. And my aerial just says it's sitting somewhere in the sky. I actually don't know where it is. And my, C my PC has a little pulse on it. Now, if the pulsar is off to the west or off to the left there, then it pings away, but my aerial still can't tell where it's coming from. It's just coming from the sky. And if it's sitting, if you have twice as much money, there's a lot of money in this talk, so it's trying, <laughs> science and money are interlinked, and I've been obsessed with money for radio telescopes for a long time. It's hard to get it out of my psyche. But if you have two aerials, twice the money, you can uh, then listen to the night sky, and you can find that there's one pulse coming from, from both of them. But what happens if the source is over to the left, over in the west? Well, then aerial one is going to see it, and aerial two will see it the second. So just looking at your PC, you see a pulse came from aerial one, and then it's time delayed by some amount, then it came from aerial two. You can now work out where pulses are coming from in the night sky. And if there was a source over here on the east, Aerial 2 is, of course, going to see it first, and then Aerial 1 is going to see it first. So we could have Aerial 1 in Ireland and Aerial 2 in Germany, and then we would be able to see where things are coming from in the night sky. And if you have lots of these antennas, you can tell east, west, north, south, 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 west, and so on, or south, south, east, and so on. Um, so this 
drove astronomers um, in, in the Netherlands initially to build something called the Low Frequency Array, LOFAR. And uh, they then invited in partners to get an enormous telescope. And it stretches here from Chilbolton, uh, where there's a radio telescope built um, uh, about, I'd say, about nearly a decade ago at this point. And this telescope connects by fibre optic cable into the central core in the Netherlands. And then it connects by fibre down to Nancy, south of Paris, up to Onsala in Sweden, uh, and then uh, out into Germany here. And then, in, in fact, it now goes out to Poland and out to Ireland. And the UK station is part of this network, making the telescope bigger. It looks strange, as I've said. This is the core of, uh, uh, of LOFAR, clearly in, in the Netherlands. Um, you can see that uh, they had a flooding problem. No problems whatsoever. We've built houses on these kind of things. They built a, a dike uh, immediately, or, and, uh, and then this is called a turp. So they raised the land, and it's called, in Dutch it's called a turp. And when we said we had flooding problems, they just laughed at us. And said, Don't worry about it. Build a dike and, the, and get a dam on the side where there's a river and uh, then raise the ground and form a turp. Of course, we went to our engineers in Ireland and they said, are you mad? We're not going to do that. We put pumps underneath it and all this complicated stuff. But eventually we built a turp. And actually we have an Irish turp now that uh, keeps us out of uh, the harm's way of the water. But these things here are the antennas. These ones here are very simple antennas, but there's 10,000 of them spread across Europe. And they're all connected by fibre optic cables. These ones here are called the high band antennas. These are the low band antennas. These see be below FM radio and these see above FM radio. So FM radio is in around 100 megahertz. These ones see below that down to about 10 megahertz. And these ones see above FM radio. They see about up to a 240 megahertz. FM radio gets in our way, in fact. We're not a great fan of FM radio. But you can go to Western Australia where they have no FM radio. So that's a great place to build radio telescopes. Or the far side of the moon. So the Chinese are there at the moment. And they have a low frequency uh, antenna on the far side of the moon. And basically what they're doing is looking to see if it's a good place to put a radio telescope. So we may see something similar to LOFAR being deployed by the Chinese on the far side of the moon in the next uh, decade or so. I think that's a really exciting prospect. So I'm very willing for you out there, the Chinese, I'm willing to go there with my team and build it on the far side of the moon. There's an offer for you. <laughs> Maybe. I'll have to clear that with my wife, actually. I'm not sure about it. <laughs> um, so the international stations are, are quite different to, to, the, to the core. This is what uh, you guys have here in the UK, um, and we also have built one in Ireland um, and in Germany and so on. But what you have, this is about the size of a football field. Um, it's about 100 metres by about 70 metres across this way. And these stamp, postage stamps here are about uh, 1.5 metres by 1.5 metres. And there's antennas on each one of those that's picking up radio waves. And they pick up radio waves at 10 to 90 megahertz. And then these ones here, which just look very strange, they look like um, you know, uh, a photovoltaic kind of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 power generation uh, devices. They're not. There's actually, underneath the tarpaulin, there's actually... Uh, um, coat hanger type antennas that are picking up uh, radio waves and they work at um, uh, 110 to 240. They're actually high band antennas, not LBAs, HBAs. And th all of the data from these then goes into this box here. And in that box, you then have an amplifier. You also have a filter. And then you, have, you, you time tag everything. And from the back of that is a fiber optic, table, fiber optic cable that then goes off to the Netherlands, where they put all the signals together. And that signal processing is a real challenge. This is huge data, uh, astronomically large data. And this is what the antennas look like. You know, they're very simple. Um, uh, it, it's, it's funny. We have a deer problem, and the deer come in and chew on our antennas. Um, so I'm a great fan of venison nowadays. And, uh, uh, that is not true whatsoever, by the way. That is not true. We built a fence, and I can tell you the cost of the fence some other time. Um, uh, so, uh, but these are the antennas themselves. Very, very simple. They're like co coat hangers. Um, radio waves come from the edge of the universe, and they come to our antennas in a field in Burr, and they bounce off this, and we pick them up with coat hanger antennas preposterous, just preposterous. And there's 10,000 of these spread all over Europe. 
And in that little top up there, there's a, a little preamp, and the preamp says, that's a weak signal, let's make it a little bit bigger, and it amplifies the signal. And uh, then it amplifies the signal and puts it on a coax cable, just like your standard TV cables, in fact, uh, that come into the back of your TV, and they come down in underneath the ground and off to the, to the box, where they all get added um, up together. The high band antennas um, look a bit stranger. This is um, a box of them. Um, it's called the IKEA radio telescope for good reason. Um, you can see, and they arrived on, I think we brought in nearly 20 articulated trucks from the Netherlands. And it was just amazing to see them come off a boat in Dublin and uh, go out through the port tub tunnel, out onto the motorway. And we got a police escort, you know, radio telescope coming with me in my car at the front. You know, that's my radio telescope. <laughs> and uh, we brought it down to Burr and, uh, and uh, put these together. But these are styrofoam uh, pieces, and inside it, there's actually the kind of, um, the, they're called bow-shaped uh, antennas. There's a little metal antenna in there, and then there's an amplifier in here, and then you sum all these weak signals together inside this, and then uh, you can make your pretty pictures of, of astronomical objects. Once the data is processed, it comes through 400 cables. Uh, we know where each one of these 400 cables go, and then from four, those 400 cables it goes into this data processing board where it amp does amplification and filtering and, and, uh, and so on. And it goes into to this box in here. This is me holding on to it, and I remember it arriving, uh, clearly remember it arriving and, and holding it with my hands as it went down onto the concrete. And, uh, and I remember it was only about that much off the ground. Um, you know, three or four centimetres, and my finger was underneath it. I said, I don't care, I'd lose one finger for astronomy. And uh, <laughs> we got it down onto the ground, and it's nice and safe. But this produces, you can just see with all these cables, we've got a data problem. And uh, so lots of data comes from all these stations, 50 low-far stations across Europe, actually, and more planned, each of them producing three gigabits per second. So at home, you probably have maybe... 30 megabits per second. Uh, maybe you have 300 megabits per second. But this is, this is a 50 grand uh, uh, um, internet bill for all of us uh, per station, which is uh, really tough. We're lucky that uh, the telecommunications company in Ireland called AIR sponsored us um, on that. But this 50 stations times three is 150 gigabits per second, all day, every day for a decade. And you're producing six petabytes per year for over a data, for over a decade. So it's just an unbelievable amount of data. And actually, what we do is, in order to transport data, we don't use the internet or fiber. We use Reiner. We get postgraduate students who go over with a bag with hard drives, and they go over to the Netherlands, and they copy the stuff onto hard disks, and then get back onto Reiner and come back with it. That's, <laughs> Reiner gives you more gigabits per second than the internet can at the moment. So thank you, Reiner. <laughs> all right, that doesn't happen very often. Um, all right. Um, so what can we see with this great telescope? Um, we can see wonderful things like this. this. This is called the Toothbrush Nebula. And you can see it has this shape of, of, of a toothbrush. And this is an image that's combined with radio data, with X-ray data, and optical data all put together. And you can see the stars, that's optical data. But the radio data and the X-ray data shows you the glows of the gas um, that can be that that is part of where the stars were formed, and that's a unique insight that radio astronomy can give us. If you zoom in, and this is the wonderful thing about LOFAR, it allows you to see the whole sky, but you can also zoom in as well. You can see all this kind of detail. Um, in there. Of course, one of the interesting objects that we had to look at was the Whirlpool Galaxy that the third Earl of Ross had first sketched. And this is a, a, a map here of the radio sky seen by Lofar, and sitting in the centre of it is, uh, the spir are, are the spiral arms of the Whirlpool Galaxy at radio waves, seeing them at about 150 megahertz. And these are the contours. It was made by a, a scientist called David Mulcahy, an Irish guy, uh, working at the um, um, University of Manchester, General Bank. And he was able to map out these contours. And this tells us about the nature of the, the gas, the magnetic field inside uh, that galaxy, in a way that optical images couldn't do. You can also zoom on e in on even smaller objects. Well, this actually is a, a huge object, but it's very small on our sky. And uh, in this case here, you have an active, uh, well, there's a black hole in here, 
surrounded by a gas cloud. And then here you have jets of relativistic electrons, electrons moving at almost the speed of light, emitting radio waves. And the X-ray images, together with the optical images, can give us an insight into these uh, enormous jets uh, that are happening um, from black holes. Here's another wonderful picture uh, that shows an optical image here uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, but this is what LOFAR sees. If you put the UK station together with the Irish station, the uh, Dutch station, the French station, put them all together to get a large telescope, you can see this kind of thing. And what you're seeing here is a gas cloud being ejected from within this object, which tells us about what's going on. There's gas being accelerated inside this object, and it streams out along here, and this is gas that's been ejected for that object. So it tells us very much about the environment that these extreme objects are in, but also maybe what's going on inside these objects. So um, I'll skip that slide, but um, we in Ireland um, decided that we wanted to become part of this. And the past decade of my life, I've spent working on this project. We put together a consortium. Uh, it involves uh, universities and institutes from Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and we also have partners with uh, Manchester, uh, with Southampton, um, and then also with Caltech in the United States. Uh, but the core uh, uh, group are, are here. And we were very happy uh, that when we went down to Burr Castle, and actually Lord and Lady Ross are here this evening, or this afternoon, uh, which is wonderful, and uh, they said, well, we have a few fields out there that, that maybe you might like to use. And they gave us uh, one of their fields, and we built a radio telescope in that field, uh, which was very generous of them. Of course... The proposal deadline happened during my uh, summer holidays. And uh, here I am uh, in the 23rd of August submitting a proposal. Here's the hat. Uh, keep the sun off my head. Um, of course, there was, a, 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 there was an electrical storm and uh, the Wi-Fi went down in my hotel and I had to go to La Belle M in the Ile de Ray, a uh, lovely little uh, uh, restaurant, and log into the Wi-Fi network of the hostel beside it and submit the proposal. So that went in very stressed and eventually... Science Foundation Ireland funded our project, so we got uh, one and a half million euros from the Irish government, and it was wonderful, uh, uh, and that allowed us to build it. Now I had two million euros in my, in my back pocket. I needed to get it from the Netherlands to Ireland, and it turned out that one of my first graduate students was a truck driver. So I rang this guy, Ryan Milligan. Uh, Ryan was working at NASA. Uh, uh, he'd done very well for himself, but in a previous life, he was a truck driver. He drove fish around Northern Ireland. And at about 25 years old, he said, I love this thing up here. I want to understand what's going on. Went back to college and became an astrophysicist. So I rang him and I said, here's your gig. He said, I'll be there in a second, Peter. Uh, that's my best Northern accent I can do. And uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, uh, <laughs> he then drove it over and uh, they made a documentary about it called Space Truckers. So you can see Ryan bringing the telescope across, listening to ACDC, and uh, bringing the telescope safely uh, to Burr Castle. And here we are. Here's me on my knees uh, saying my prayers. Um, and, uh, and here's Ryan gently lowering it and uh, uh, getting this uh, in, in place here. And a uh, very nervous time. But once we had all of this, we had to get some people to help us with it. So we hired a load of um, uh, uh, interns. And said, what a great opportunity. Come build a radio telescope in, in Burr Castle. Uh, and we got loads of applicants, and we hired people from Spain, from America, uh, from the UK, from Ireland, uh, boys and girls. We did a great social experiment. We rented a house. We put them all into the house for three months, uh, which I, we should have made a doc documentary about that as well. So I think uh, uh, great relationships were made um, in that house, and uh, plenty of... Um, uh, uh, alcohol was consumed, I believe, uh, at least the evidence from outside the back garden uh, <laughs> when, when we would go on, our, on you know, our weekly check of the place. But they did a wonderful job. They built our radio telescope. And here they are working. It was arduous work, absolutely arduous work. Um, they're, they're working with builders and they're wearing hard hats. Uh, Wellington boots with steel toe caps, and they're laying these cables. This lady here is um, Aoife Ryan. She's now a PhD student of mine. But look how proud she is. She's, take, she's putting it on Twitter. She's so proud of the way that they have laid these cables. And this lady over here is Diana Morrison. Diana did all of the cabling in here. She's now a postdoc in Finland, having uh, built this radio telescope uh, uh, with us. But the team then built the antennas as well. Here they are putting together the antenna elements, working together... 
And here they are then deploying it out into the field. And after three months, um, we had a telescope. We had a radio telescope that again connected to the International LOFAR telescope. And here's our TERP, as you can see. So it's about a metre off the ground. There's an annoying river over here that sometimes um, can flood, uh, but we've never seen a flood um, uh, that will get us here. And these are made of styrofoam. So, you know, the, wet, the water comes in and the styrofoam is going to float. And the last thing I want to see on the international media is Irish radio telescopes floats off down river. <laughs> you know, that's not the kind of press we want. We want to, you know, uh, astronomers make profound discovery. So we have a turp and uh, everything is pinned down so they can't blow away or float away. Um, and these were nervous times. We weren't allowed to turn on the telescope. And uh, the Dutch came over to turn on the telescope. And here's three very gr grumpy and very nice uh, engineers from uh, the Netherlands. And they came over and they flicked the switch. And uh, this, this gentleman here, is, uh, the, he was the chief engineer on the project, Joe McCauley. And uh, uh, he and I were very nervous on that day. We were sure smoke was going to come out of something. Uh, but no smoke did come out of it. And no fire came out of it either. <laughs> But we got a bang, and the bang were, was this beautiful spectrum. You can see my shadow here, the shiny head, and, uh, uh, and my cell phone. Uh, but here is a spectrum, and what's beautiful about this is this shows that it's pretty flat. That just shows that we've got a lovely, crisp, clear spectrum. Burr Castle in the centre of Ireland, away from the big cities, is a nice place to do radio astronomy. This is shortwave radio down here, which is fine. It's communications, so we just notch that out. Uh, but it's a nice, clear spectrum. And every single antenna worked. Unbelievable and great testament to the work that uh, uh, the students and uh, Joe McCauley did. We then turned on the high band antennas. Again, they were nice and flat as well. Nothing exciting going on in there. This is digital broadcast TV, probably, um, but we, they're very narrow band. So now we have a toy. We have a wonderful toy that we can do great science with. We turned it on in July, and we were able to look at the, at, at the Milky Way. There's the Milky Way sitting directly above us in the middle of the day. And I love the fact you can see the stars at the middle of the day, through the clouds, through the rain, in Ireland. And that, that's what the radio sky looks like. We weren't sure if we were looking at the right things, so here we are. We plotted where Cassiopeia A is, which is a supernova remnant. We plotted where Cygnus A is, a radio galaxy, and they both lined up exactly where they should be. And this, is, um, this, is a, this, this here is an ejection from a supernova. So everything was lined up. So we hadn't rotated the telescope the wrong way. And that has happened. People have placed the telescope in the wrong uh, orientation. And then you can zoom in, use the entire network, plug the Irish and the British and all of the other ones together, and then you can make these kind of really detailed pictures with the telescope. And our station then made the telescope nearly 30% bigger. You know, it was only, uh, it was a small telescope, really, but it made the entire telescope much, much bigger, allowing us to see finer, <coughs> finer detail. And you can watch all day and all night, every day, every night. And this is the kind of things, if you're looking for flashes out there from objects, from something, this is the way you do it. You monitor the, the sky constantly to see what's going on out there. And then you build computer systems that are listening to your data. And one of the things that we first noticed in there was a pulsar, just like Jocelyn Bell had discovered in the 1960s, 51 years ago, actually. Uh, we saw a pulsar, so we could see all these pulses coming on. This is made by Evan Keane from the University of Manchester, actually. And uh, Evan was able to see this pulse. And it comes from a rotating star that's uh, rotating around. Some of them are actually rotating thousands of times per second. So just imagine an object, you know, a few kilometres, maybe 10 kilometres across, rotating thousands of times per second. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, the kind of extreme physics that's going on. But me, I'm a simple solar physicist, actually, and I love the sun. And these are the kind of things that I study, which are called solar mass ejections or coronal mass ejections. And soon after we turned on the telescope, in solar minimum, we had an enormous solar flare. So this is taken from the 10th of September 2017, just a few months after we turned on, and there was this enormous eruption on the sun. And what we found was that this explosion went off 
but our radio telescope went crazy. We just saw lots of pops and bursts and wiggles on the radio spectrum. And this was a really exciting discovery. And we were able to see, and this, is, this makes me excited, maybe not you, but it goes from 30 megahertz to 55 megahertz over several minutes. And it's just saying that the sun is producing all these little streaks of radio bursts. And those radio bursts come from electrons moving along open magnetic field lines coming out of the sun. And they're driven by these explosions. So we can use this here together with the core of LOFAR to work out not only what's going on, but where it's going on on the sun. And this was a great discovery uh, made by Diana Morrison and, and the rest of the team uh, looking at this um, uh, event. Now, you may have noticed last week one of the really exciting things that's happening in astronomy at the moment are things called FRBs, fast radio bursts. Of course, you've all seen the aliens headlines, or the alien headlines last week. I will not be answering any questions on aliens this afternoon, okay? Well, I, I may try. Uh, but this was an amazing discovery. In the, about 2007, looking with a, a radio telescope out into the sky, flashes going off. And these flashes were not associated with known galaxies. Nobody knew where these flashes were coming from. And they're happening over fractions of a second. But it isn't just fractions of a second. There's it, the energy is about 10,000 years of the sun glowing. That's how much energy happens in a fraction of a second. And they're happening all over the sky. Now, if they were from our galaxy, they'd be, they'd be along here. But they're not. These things are extragalactic. In fa fact, they're very, very, very far away. They're billions of light years uh, uh, away from us. And what was really interesting was that one of them repeated. So the initial suggestion was, oh, well, we get a couple of heavy things, clash them together, and you get a burst. OK, we could probably explain that one. But how do we explain something that repeats? How do we get a repeat burst of so much energy? And that's a real problem. So a lot of people said, well, maybe that wasn't right. Maybe it was an artifact. But last week, the discovery with the Canadian telescope called CHIME saw another repeat fast radio burst. And we're doing a follow-up right today, actually. We're doing a follow-up to see if we can see these fast radio bursts um, using uh, uh, LOFAR below 400 megahertz. So very exciting times for radio astronomy and lots of interesting things to, 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 um, to discover. And I think with that, I will finish up with a little poem that uh, one of my colleagues from... Um, from, uh, from Trinity College Dublin wrote, and uh, i just tell you that SFI is Science Foundation Ireland. So the poem goes as follows. Uh, Bless this telescope, we pray. May it work by night and day. Bless the castle walls so stout, keeping troublemakers out. Bless the antennae so tall, may their signals never stall. Bless the students late to bed, sleeping in an ex-cow shed. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Bless the solace shining bright, sending radio wavelength light. Bless the SFI as well. Make them less of an hard sell. Bless the whole great enterprise. Send us soon a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So that standing talk. Um, just before I invite questions, something I forgot to say, the, the library of the Royal Astronomical Society has some drawings, original drawings, that were taken with the Leviathan Telescope at Burr Castle. And if anyone's interested in seeing them, then you're uh, welcome to go over after, well, at two o'clock, after, we, after we've just finished the questions, uh, to the library of the RAS, which is just across the courtyard of the, um, the Royal... If you go out the door on, on, on to Piccadilly, it turned right, then right again and into Burlington House, and the RAS is there, and the librarian is expecting you. So. Um, right, uh, questions? Easy ones. <laughs> Please. Oh, sorry. So there is a microphone. Yes, sorry, I should have said that. St Steve is kindly taking the microphone, so I'll come to you. Thank you. Um, to switch it on. I think it, no, it's on. It's on. Um, where's the UK loafer? And... Um, <laughs> You seem to use nebula and galaxy interchangeably. I know. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well spotted. Well spotted. I'm biased by my generation. <laughs> um, the nebula galaxy uh, idea. So at the time in the 1800s, they were called nebulae, of course, because they were unresolved gas clouds. We now know that they are galaxies that, com that, that uh, 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 contain many nebulae. Um, so that's, uh, so the, the Earl of Ross never would have called it a galaxy. 
Um, so he resolved it to show that there was many details in it. Um, as regards the UK station, um, uh, it is, where is, what's the name of the county that it's in? Uh, does anybody know? Uh, no. Chilbolton, that's it, yeah, it's, it's in Chilbolton, wherever Chilbolton is. South of, south of, uh, of Oxford, <laughs> uh, uh, be, be near the coast, so halfway between Oxford and the coast is, is roughly where it is. Um, Hampshire, would it be Hampshire? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Chilbolton is in Hampshire, yeah. Steve, there was a couple of questions there. There's a gentleman in the red jumper, I think, was, was, was next. Actually, I should say the, uh, the, 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 the people who built the low fire station in the UK uh, gave us a huge amount of help when we were building our station. We came and visited, and uh, uh, we have a very close collaboration with them, uh, doing radio bursts uh, monitoring, but we're also doing some SETI research uh, with them as well. So we, we, we have a computational cluster that is uh, listening to data from the UK station and from the Irish station, doing some, you know, what are those strange signals? Are there any strange signals out there? So there's a very good connection between us. The high and low frequency arrays uh, look different. One is very geometric and the other appears random or semi-random. I wondered why the difference is there. Yeah, um, when you have two antennas and you point them up at a, a star, um, you, you, the signal that you get out is a combination of the star's signal and an artifact from the antennas. And the artifact from the antennas has a big lobe in the center of it and then these other lobes at e either side. So you end up with something that doesn't look like a star. It's got rings around it. And if you have them very symmetric, you get big rings, big side lobes. Uh, but if you put it in a random pattern, you minimize those side lobes and you minimize the side lobes and the rings and you end up with just what's called a pencil beam. So it gives you a response that's very centralized and you're not picking up stuff from the sides uh, effectively. So you want a random array. Uh, with the high band antennas, you can see they're regular. Um, that was difficult to put them into a regular array. So what we do is um, we can electronically <laughs> turn the individual ones off here and then we create a semi-random uh, uh, distribution of those to minimize so-called side lobes. Okay. Hope that answers your question. Uh, when you showed the sun and the mass, e mass ejection, um, presumably the sun is rotating on its axis. Uh, what was the orientation of the axis, do you think? I mean, is the uh, an ejection from the equatorial side, or yeah. is it from the polar side, or? Okay, or so, it uh, random? It, so, um, Solar activity generally comes from belts of activity on the sun. The North Pole and the South Pole are pretty uh, quiet, uh, but sunspots appear within plus or minus 60 degrees in latitude from the equator. So uh, you don't get any solar activity really from high latitudes. So everything's from the equatorial belt of activity. Um, and during the solar activity cycle, they, they kind of they, they go down to the, the equator and come back up. But all activity is from those activity belts where there are sun spots. In our case there, it came from the western side, just off the equator. Uh, so we do know where, where the spin axis is. We're watching it every day, and you can see it uh, rotating around once every 28 days. Um, and in all of our movies, we rotate them. In fact, coordinate conversions are one of our um, uh, absolute nightmare uh, things because you'll be comparing data from the Earth with a spacecraft, and there'd be another spacecraft that's off somewhere else in the solar system, and they're all looking in at the same object. So we've got to transform them all to the same plane. Uh, so we spend a lot of time dealing with that. But we know exactly where the poles are and where the equator is. Yeah. Okay, Steve, there's a couple behind you. Thanks. That segues to my question, I think. Presumably, uh, you have to define the center of low far and, and what is overhead for everybody. And when you add a new station, does that migrate slightly to rebalance it? Okay, so again, coordinate conversions <laughs> and surveying was one of our, one of our headaches uh, during the building of this. Um, every single antenna is known to plus or minus three centimetres uh, for, for the high band antennas and plus or minus six centimetres for all, all of the, sorry, low band antennas is plus or minus three cent. Let's do this right. 
Low band antennas plus minus six centimetres, high band antennas plus minus three centimetres. Um, and we use a European grid referencing uh, system as well, so which takes into account the deformation of the European continent. So everything's known very precisely, um, uh, both in latitude and longitude, but also in elevation. And that's all put into then a coordinate um, a model of the entire array. Um, uh, the entire array isn't always used, so sometimes you'll just use the core and the centre becomes uh, with in uh, the Netherlands, uh, and then as you turn on international stations, yes, you will. The centre of the entire array will shift slightly, but you do uh, take all of those uh, things into account. Um, it's really important to know where everything is to get your mapping uh, right. Um, it's funny. There's um, in Goonhilly in Cornwall. There's um, a radio telescope there. It's a 32 meter diameter, and um, they can see. Uh, the deformation of Cornwall moving up and down uh, with great accuracy. Um, all right. Um, yeah, how big can it get? Aha. And um, is it possible to see, do you stream the data on a website that we can people can watch or look at? Um, okay, so two questions there. How big can it get? Um, so the Italians are going to build one uh, very soon, which is wonderful. We'll have uh, Sweden to Italy. Uh, we'll have Poland to Ireland, and they're the two biggest axes. Poland to Ireland is nearly 2,000 kilometres. Um, the Ukrainians may look at doing something, but once you get much bigger than that, like if we were to put one in America, we have a problem with the Earth's ionosphere. So about... Um, 80 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, we've got this ionized layer called the ionosphere, which radio waves bounce off. But radio waves, as they move through the ionosphere, they get bent and they get refracted. Um, and over Europe, we can model it and we can work out what the ionosphere is doing. But once you go to the United States, it's a very different ionosphere, or if you go down to, say, North Africa, and that becomes a real challenge. How do we cope with the ionosphere? So that's one problem with it. The other thing is that the radio waves, because they're so far apart, um, putting them back together again becomes diff different as well to reconcile those signals. There's a lot of problems uh, with that. Um, what was the second part of your question? Uh, oh, st uh, can you see the data somewhere? Um, uh, there's a, you can have a look at lofar.org, and there are some data there. Lofar data is really challenging to, to, to work with. It comes in looking very nasty, and it takes many, many months to get pretty pictures out of them. So what you get in initially are time series of ugly data that needs to be processed. So it's not something that um, you know, is, is wonderful to look at uh, until the processing happens and many teams work together, unfortunately. I think we have to leave it to, to one last question. I think the gentleman in the blue shirt. <coughs> of course, if you were on the moon, you wouldn't have an island. Uh, yes, yeah, very good, good, good reason for going to the moon. It's funny, I read a proposal at NASA uh, at one point, and they had a proposal from the 1960s to put a low-frequency radio telescope on the moon. So it's been an idea that's been around for, for a long time. Yeah. Going back to the sun and the image you showed of a CME or prominence, it looked very detailed. Now, there's an ongoing uh, question about the temperature of the sun. It's... Uh, about 6,000 degrees on the surface, which expands up to about a million degrees. Is it possible to interpret the information from what your signals are to Ooh, very interesting. what is happening? Yeah, yeah. So this is a big embarrass sorry, problem uh, <laughs> in, um, in, in, in solar physics. Um, in, in about 1920, uh, at an eclipse, uh, astronomers saw that there was very hot gas around the corona. And uh, this corona was 1 to 2 million degrees Kelvin, or Celsius, doesn't matter actually. Uh, but as you move a few thousand kilometers from the surface, the temperature goes up. And you know, at home, you walk away from the fire. As you move away from the fire, it gets cooler. And the sun it went the exact opposite way. So we've been arguing about this for, for, for a century almost. Isn't that awful? And uh, there are two theories. One theory is waves come up from underneath the sun, and as they move upwards into the tenuous atmosphere, they cause shocks. The other theory is there's lots of little pops of explosions happening all over the corona. But both of those will leave signatures in the radio waves. And I think that's one thing that we can look at, is to see if there's evidence for explosions or waves that we can see in the radio data. And if that's the case, we might solve the, solve the coronal heating problem. It's a challenging one, and I've heard that said a million times, but that's the big one for, for solar physics, to work that out. Well, the challenge may be that there's a probe up there now. Solar probe. Close.
if you can beat them. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to do a bit of com competition with the Americans any day. <laughs> okay, so, so we have a Can we just thank Peter again for it?